the killing grounds of Ethiopia, for every victim unearthed, there's a murderer unpunished. These people were criminals. Some of them are in Europe, some of them are in America. I won't say they have to be killed, but I want the world to know who these people are and what they have done. You might forgive, but you could never forget. in mourning. It was only two years ago that people were able to give vent to the grief that shadowed every family during the 17 silent years of fear under the regime of Mengistu Haile Mariam. These are the relatives of Mengistu's first victims, members of Haile Selassie's imperial government executed without trial in November 1974, the year Mengistu began his blood-stained rise to power. Today, the Mengistu regime stands accused of crimes against humanity, the murder of tens of thousands of dissidents, the massacre of civilians in wartime, and the exploitation of the Great Famine of 1984-85 for political ends. The current government is preparing a series of extensive trials in the coming months, and the exhumation of this mass grave is just part of the process to establish an accurate historical record. The remains of uh, high government officials, military officials, massacred here. So they took a total of 60 people, of which there were two prime ministers, one prince. There were 25 ministers, provincial governors. There were uh, 11 uh, lieutenant generals four major generals, two brigadier generals, one commander of the Navy, three colonels, and uh, seven of other ranks. So in total, there were 60 people. The killing set the tone for what was to come, an era in which mass terror was the instrument of government policy. Ethiopia under Mengistu was arguably the most authoritarian state in Africa. During his time, the army grew tenfold, from 50,000 to half a million strong, a build-up of men and machines that left the rest of society impoverished. But it was an edifice built on the people's fear and propped up by force. Popular support lay with the rebel movements who entered the capital, Addis Ababa, in May 1991, exactly three years ago. Since then, the government has begun the difficult task of reconciling the popular pressure to avenge the atrocities of the past with the need to rebuild a nation. And in building up a legal system, the government has had to start from scratch, as there was no independent judiciary under Mengistu. These are the surprisingly young members of the newly formed Special Prosecutor's Office, whose task it is to marshal evidence for the forthcoming trials. Today, the prosecutors are acting on information that a cache of incriminating documents has been found in what used to be the office of a neighborhood association.
There were nearly 300 of these in the capital alone. Far from being community centers, they were outposts of the regime, part of the massive web of security agents and bureaucrats that monitored everyone. The leaders of these associations had vast powers, even the power to kill. What's unique about Ethiopia is that the present government owes no favors to the regime it deposed. In every other country, attempts to expose crimes against humanity have been hobbled by the need to placate the wrongdoers or the lack of international support for the process. So the prosecution here could well turn out to be the most comprehensive test of human rights legislation since the Nuremberg trials. So far, the prosecutor's office has amassed over a quarter of a million pages of documents. International observers told us you would have to go back to Nazi Germany to find such abundant proof of human rights violations. Even the torture of opponents was filmed. We discovered this cupboard full of tapes. This is an application for membership of the Workers' Party of Ethiopia. Admission ensured a fast track to promotion, but you had to prove your political commitment. This applicant boasts that he took revolutionary measures against members of the opposition, a euphemism for sending people to their deaths. Each order to kill was noted and copied to superiors, a vast paper trail of telltale evidence. Even the cost of an execution was recorded and parents made to pay for the bullets which killed their children. The prosecutor's office can barely cope with the load of paperwork already amassed. Rodolfo Matarolo, an expert on human rights law, is one of several foreign advisors to the Ethiopian prosecutor. He honed his craft in his native Argentina, working on the human rights abuses under that country's military regimes. There is a lot of documentary evidence, according to the prosecutors that are investigating cases. And this is very original. In Argentina, for instance, the military destroyed the evidence before the takeover of President Alfonsín. In the case of Ethiopia, the former officials didn't have time to do that. Lawyers for the prosecution have so far taken nearly 5,000 statements from victims and their relatives. Haji Omar Jeju's son Muhyiddin was killed in 1978, but until now he never knew how. The information was all there in the files including the minutes of his interrogation. And today the family is able to look at the documents which sent Muhyiddin to his death. They're even able to see the signature against the execution order. Omar's son was a member of an opposition group and was betrayed by a one-time friend. He was imprisoned and tortured. For a while, Omar was also arrested and father and son held in the same jail.
ምንም ሸከማው ነበር በዛ ጊዜው ጊዜ የነበረው እናት ሰው ባልተፈጠረ ባልተፈጠረ ቁይሚያስተኝ ነበር in this country we have all the the types of crimes against humanity summary executions enforced disappearances torture applied in a systematic scale and this is the legal definition of a crime against humanity it was all done in the name of ideology the copycat monument harked back to the vicious certainties of the stalinist era you were either for mengistu's interpretation of communism or against it there was no middle ground to defend his vision of ethiopia mengistu was prepared to declare war on anyone who opposed him The smash bottle, the blood spilt, the imagery was as accurate as it was brutal. That speech effectively marked the beginning of what Ethiopians call the Red Terror. Tens of thousands were killed as government supporters and security agents unleashed a campaign against opposed counter-revolutionaries. It was political homicide, the sacrifice of life in the pursuit of dogma. The fate of the people in this town, Aksum, depended on the whim of just one man. His name was Atawarki, a thug who killed at random, flourishing at a time when cruelty passed for political fervor. Tureetu sabi mesib. Tureh ogenna ay diablo sirah. Sabi mesajja sirah wa tsaj kuna sirah sirah wa ilay. Zi qayyih nagara wa zi asiru. Afta amu afu muzna ay tsalanja. Qayyih ruusu karabatu wa karabat al mesib. اي عاشيرو عجبو ايزقي سلازي تيزي بزحالو فوق قصري بتاعم ايزي ناچنقت منفس نيو ابيبي's brother was killed along with five other students and after work he denied him burial inside the church walls before that after work he used the killings to warn and terrorize others دريو مفكر هاو اي رعدي جنا كفاح حامي اطال اي كم نزي ام تمثله نابله مفكر هي كبروا انا لو زوانو نوعو ابو ملو ما حمش يوم انا زورو كبروا انا له كم زي كبر The vast majority of those killed in the Red Terror, which lasted for over two years in the late 70s, were students. At the height of the campaign, about a quarter of a million people, some as young as 12, were imprisoned. The students had been part of the popular revolt that had brought down Haile Selassie's imperial government. But when Mengistu's regime turned out to be as dictatorial as the monarchy it replaced, the student movement began a campaign of urban guerrilla warfare and public protest. Mengistu responded in brutal fashion. Just to be able to read and write and in your teens was enough to be branded as a counter-revolutionary. Miyaza was 18, the same age as her sister is now when she and her younger brother were arrested. Both were accused of being members of a student movement, the EPRP, and tortured together. They brought a rope, a plastic rope. They tied us, was uh, literally our upper arm here, backwards, and they tighten it 
and they hung the rope to the ceiling. Both of us were uh, hung in the same room uh, near each other. Well, you can imagine what it looks like having your brother near, <laughs> near you, beaten in the jail. <laughs> They were beating us and asking us to tell them something. They, well, we have told them that we were, of course, a member of ETRP, but we didn't do anything. Then they took us, and uh, for five months, my hands were not working, they were paralyzed. And of course my brother died, died without his hands working back. And my hand can't carry heavy things. Even I can't carry my child in my hands because it gets weak uh, quickly. So I can't hold him like this. I have to just play him when he's um, in my bed. By the way, just not to forget my brother. My little son is named Stephanus after him. And every family has its faded portrait. Even the most conservative estimates put the numbers killed at over 50,000, a lost generation. This is a meeting of the anti-Red Terror Committee, parents and relatives who've come together to demand justice and they want revenge. The prosecution hopes to prove that together the killings amounted to a state crime. Nazihin Fredacho Siaga Nudras, the Tagalalo.